Hi everybody, and welcome to the OCL Copyright Webinar for the Open Course Library grant. I'd like to introduce Greg Grossmeyer to you. He is the Education Technology and Policy Coordinator for Creative Commons. So thank you for doing this, Greg, and I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Ro. Um, so thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I think this came out of a, a quick conversation that Tom and, and I had when they were here um, at Creative Commons for a, uh, a grant meeting on a different grant, actually. Um, and he thought that since I had a library background and I also work at Creative Commons, it would be the perfect fit for um, a webinar with you guys. And I think it will be. Um, so I was a library librarian at the University of Michigan Library um, before I joined Creative Commons. Uh, graduated from the University of Michigan School of Information before that. Um, so I, I assume um, since you guys are calling yourselves librarians, you are actually AOA accredited librarians. <laughs> um, so that's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are such um, good resources available for this project. Um, you're not just having um, everyone do it by themselves. There's actually real honestly guy librarians helping them. So that's a really great project. Um, so I'm going to talk about copyright and Creative Commons um, and how you guys can think about it and, and know a little bit more so that you can answer all the questions that um, your faculty are having or students are having and, and be able to feel a little bit more confident in the answers you're getting, hopefully. Um, so here's the outline. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of copyright um, and then move into Creative Commons, um, which is a, a system which is um, uses copyright. Um, and then I'm going to do a couple plugs for a couple projects um, that I'm either working on or working with um, that directly relate to the work that you guys are doing. Um, and they deal with metadata. Um, so if you remember those classes in school, um, it's metadata for the web for these two projects. But anyways, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so first of all, a disclaimer. I am not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice. So um, even though I kind of play a lawyer during the day, I give people advice on copyright licensing. Um, at the University of Michigan Library, I was a copyright specialist, um, which even though I didn't have a JD, meant that I was giving people um, non-legal guidance in their um, thought processes about dealing with copyright or publishing and things like that. But at the end of the day, I'm not a lawyer, and, and don't take what I say necessarily to the bank. Um, if you need to go to a, a, <laughs> a lawsuit or something. But I'm not going to lead you astray at the same time. Um, so here's copyright. What is copyright? Um, so it, it comes from the U.S. Constitution. Um, it's to promote the progress of science and useful arts um, by securing for limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to the respective works and discoveries. So that's the clause which gives um, Congress the right to make a thing known as copyright and a thing known as patents. Um, the writings and discoveries are basically the, the two things that, that they can give protection to, copyright and patent stuff. But what really is copyright? Um, so it's a bundle of rights. Um, that's a good way to think about it. It's, kind of, it's made up of, of a few different sticks, if you want to think about it, like a, a bundle of sticks. Um, so one stick is the right to reproduce the work. Um, the other stick is the right to prepare derivatives, the right to distribute the work, the right to perform the work, the right to display the work, and the right to license any of those previous sticks to anyone else. Um, and with those sticks, you can, whoops, um, you can, all those different things are, are what's protected by copyright. Um, so if you're thinking about dealing with something that's protected by copyright, you can think of it in, within those categories and you'll know more about how the law works with that. Um, but how do you get copyright? Or more grammatically correct, how do you receive copyright protection for your work? Um, well, first it has to meet some basic requirements. It has to be original. Um, it must have some level of creativity and it must be in a fixed medium. So original, obvious, you can't just copy something else. Um, that might be copyright infringement or at least plagiarism, um, which are two distinct different things. One might be other, the other, but they might not be the same. Um, it must have some little creativity. So it can't just be um, something like 2 plus 2 equals 4. There's no creativity in that. 
Um, that's purely a factual statement. There's no authorship. Um, so that is not protected by copyright. And it also must be in a fixed medium. So it has to be recorded somehow, written down um, on a napkin, on a hard drive, on a piece of paper, recorded on videotape or audio tape, whatever. It can't just be ephemeral. So me talking right now, if, this, if the recording button wasn't happening, wasn't going on right now over Collaborate, um, my speech, my the, the words I am speaking right now are not protected by copyright. But since it's being recorded, that recording is protected by copyright. Um, and in the old days, you used to have to put the little copyright symbol, provide a date, and also register it with the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, so there was actually a registry of copyright entries. People would send a um, registration and pay the fee to the U.S. Copyright Office and there would be a stamp of approval that yes, you have copyright protection for your work. Um, nowadays, you don't need to do any of those things. Those are um, known as the, um, now I'm blanking on the word, the, the formalities. Um, we got rid of those formalities when we joined the Berne Convention, which is an international copyright treaty among uh, many different countries um, around the world that kind of made a baseline requirement for copyright um, in all countries that signed on to it. And one of the baseline requirements is you don't need to do any of those things. You don't need to register your copyright or put the little C with a circle around it on the work. Um, so what that means is if you were at the bar last night and you did a little doodle on the napkin, that little doodle on the napkin is protected by copyright, even if you didn't want it to be. Um, so copyright is automatic, um, right, and it's instant. The instant it is recorded, the instant it is um, put in that fixed medium, it is protected by copyright. There is no delay. Um, so what does copyright protect? It protects writings, choreography, music, visual art, film, and even ar architectural works. Um, it also does not, but it does not protect ideas, facts, data, as long as that data, um, if we're talking about scientific data, is made up mostly of facts, um, and also useful articles. Useful articles are protected by patents. Um, that's a different set of intellectual property law. Um, so how long does copyright protection last for? Um, right now, it is life of the author plus 70. Um, for individual works, for works that are made for hire, uh, things that are owned by a corporation, um, those are 95 years after the date of publication. Um, but who knows, in the next few years, we might see another extension to copyright as soon as you know, Mickey Mouse gets close to falling into or rising into the public domain. Um, after that, after the term of um, copyright is expired, Things become into the public domain. The public domain being a very specifically divine, defined thing here in the U.S. Um, this is a concept that is actually not universal. Um, there is not the term the public domain in all countries, but in the U.S., it is um, the status of a work as being not protected by copyright of any sort. There is no copyright protection for it. So, what is in the public domain? Um, so, things before 1923. Um, are pretty much, as long as they were published, um, in the public domain. Things between 1923 and 1963, well, that's this huge gray area. Um, that depends on whether or not they complied with those formalities that I spoke of before, um, the, you know, registering with the Copyright Office. And then in that time period between 23 and 63, um, the term of copyright had been changed a couple of times. So it depends on when it was published and how long that copyright lasts for and if they renewed their copyright um, because in that time there was a 28-year plus a 28-year renewal. So there's a bunch of different, it depends for that time period. Basically, if you come across something in that time period, you've got to do a little bit of sleuthing. Um, I've tried to do this a few times for a few works and it's not the easiest thing um, because you would think that the U.S. Copyright Office, which is at the Library of Congress, would have um, a database, an a electronic database of all um, copyright registrations in their records, but they do not. Um, unfortunately, the, the only system that can search those, unless you go there and physically look at the books or, ha or pay someone to go there and physically look at the books, is using, ironically enough, Google Book Search scans of copyright registry books. Um, so you're, you're um, basing your analysis off of OCR text, which isn't always the safest, but 
regardless that's the situation you're in. Um, and then the third category is works authored by the federal government. So things that are produced by the federal government um, by federal government employees during their course of work are not protected by copyright. That is explicitly laid out in the U.S. Constitution and in the Copyright Act, and in the Constitution and the Copyright Act, um, and that ensures that everything that is produced by the federal government by your tax dollars are available to all um, equally. Um, now, there are certain situations where the U.S. government can hold copyrights to works, um, where if they contracted out to a third party and that third party created that work, there's a copyright in that work because, um, you know, Lockheed Martin produced a writing and that writing is protected by copyright because Lockheed Martin wrote it, but then it gets transferred to the U.S. government. So there's some gray area there, but as long as it's authored by a federal government employee during their work, then it's in the public domain. Um, so things that are not in the public domain are things that are still protected by copyright, the inverse of all that. So published after 1963 pretty much is not in the public domain. It's protected by copyright. Um, and between 23 and 63, obviously, is that the gray area again. Um, and then state and municipal works. Um, in the U.S., the states and municipalities do not have the same um, exemption to copyright as the federal government. Um, I think, I keep thinking there's one city in I think is Oregon that um, decided that their works are in the public domain, but it's by far the exception. Um, the rule is pretty much all state and municipal works are protected by copyright. Um, let's see here. There was a slide there. So right, that brings me to Creative Commons. So Creative or copyright is kind of confusing. Um, it can be really when you get down into the weeds of it. So Creative Commons tries to clarify clarify some of that confusion. Um, so here's a uh, nice representation of the current world of media creation. Um, it is you know a few people taking photographs, making movies, um, writing a book, playing music, and a dinosaur. Um, and back in the old days, right before there was digital stuff, you could make a painting, you know, create a painting, um, hang it on your wall, give it to a friend, or sell it for some money. But now, obviously, in the digital age, you can do all three of those things at the same time. You can print it out and hang it on your wall. You can print out a copy and give it to your friend. And you can print out another copy and sell it to someone for some money. Um, and But once someone receives that work from, from you, that they cannot do what they want to with it because it's protected by copyright or restricted by copyright. Um, they are limited in the actions they can take. And that applies to all types of works, all kinds of creative works, uh, music videos, uh, writings, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the things that I elucidated before about um, what's protected by copyright. And then, so that's where Creative Commons comes in. When authors want to tell others how they want them to be able to use it or not use it. Um, so we provide a suite of licenses. I'm sure you all know this. Um, there are six main licenses that you can apply to your work. Um, the, there are they, the, the six licenses are listed right there. I'll go through those different modules one by one. Um, so the first module is attribution, which means you can do what you want to. Just give me attribution. Cite your sources. Um, you know, you use my work, so just give a link back to me. Tell, tell the world that you used my work. Um, and all the licenses re have that requirement to it. There's also the non-commercial module, which basically means only I can make money from my work. Um, you can't use my work in a commercial manner. Um, then there's this concept of no derivatives. So that means you can share my work, you can make a copy of it, but you can't make a derivative of it. You can't make changes to it. So you can't take my dinosaur painting and kill my dinosaur and scribble all over the sky. But what that also means is people can't take your dinosaur painting and improve it either. So it, it, it prevents um, negative effects to your works, but it also prevents positive effects to your works. So that's something to, to keep in mind there. And then there's this concept, or the last module, of share alike. And that means that if you um, take my work and you make modifications to it, um, I don't want you to be able to license it differently. I don't want you to take my work that I have under an attribution share alike license and all of a sudden restrict other people from using it um, and applying a no derivatives license to it. So you can think of it like this on the, the um, kind of a genealogy way where the source painting there down at the bottom, 
um, is the painting that I shared with the world. And if you go to, to the right and up a little bit, someone took that painting and, and made a modification to it. And that new modification, that new painting that was based off my painting is also under attribution share alike. And then if you go to the top right again, someone takes the derivative of that, that new derivative is also under the same license and it does that forever. So it kind of ensures the freedom of the work, ensures the, the license stays with the work no matter what. Um, so if you take those four modules and you mash them together, you get six licenses, and that works out, I promise. Um, and it's easy to think about those licenses on a spectrum. So here you have the sum rights reserved spectrum, basically. Um, on the far left-hand side, you have the public domain, so no copyright. There's no protections to do whatever you want, no holes barred. Um, on the far right-hand side, um, it's all rights reserved. Um, you must ask for permission to do pretty much anything, unless it's covered by fair use, um, but that's a gray area as well. So in between there, though, there was nothing for the longest time. It was either no holds barred or ask for permission every single time you do something. So Creative Commons stepped in and provided those six licenses that fills that gap. So our least restrictive license is the attribution only license, and then attribution share alike, and then attribution non-commercial, and not attribution non-commercial share alike, attribution no derivatives, and non-commercial no derivatives. Um, so that's kind of a good way to think about that. And for OER projects, um, you really only want to stick to the first couple, maybe few. Um, you obviously don't want to use something that's under a no derivatives license because that means that you can't, for instance, translate it or make simple modifications to better adapt to your own students' learning. Um, so you have a textbook that um, needs to be, you know, uh, you know, so the, the, the obvious use case is translated to a different language. Um, that can't happen. A translation is a derivative, and if it's under a no derivative license, it can't be translated. Um, also, other things just like taking excerpts from a few different textbooks because they all teach something in a very similar way um, as to how you know your students are best learning, or at least a subset of your students are best learning this topic. Um, so you know how your students learn, and you're taking the best little snippets from a few of them, and you try to make your own new textbook. Well, you can't do that if those source textbooks are under a no derivatives license. So if you're trying to contribute to the OER world, we, being Creative Commons, highly recommend using the attribution only license, which actually I believe your grant um, has that requirement. So you guys are A-OK. -okay. You guys are pretty much doing everything I know is, is pretty much right from what you're doing. Um, so good job. Uh, let's see. So right, the licenses come in three layers. Um, so you can see here the machine readable, the human readable, and the legal code. So the most important one kind of is the legal code. Um, this is the thing which gives the licenses their teeth, their actual legal standing within the court of law. Um, this is a contract that um, is, is binding. It's been um, adjudicated over um, a few times throughout the world. Um, so the licenses have been found to be valid. Um, but it is also, it's also about four or five pages when you print it out. So, and just like all contracts and licenses, it has special terms and weird definitions and things like that that people, normal people, don't necessarily understand or want to take the time to understand. That's why we created human readable deeds of all of our licenses. We summarize that legal code. Unfortunately, we have to have that legal code so complex because that's just the way that the world unfortunately works in copyright, where you have to um, basically mention all these various different things. And if you don't, you run a risk of not being a valid license. So the license is long, but our human readable deed summarizes all that. Um, basically, so for here, it's the attribution only license. It says you are free to share and you are free to remix as long as you give attribution. And then there's you know the general understanding is that you know there's a waiver. Um, it does not apply to things that are in the public domain. It doesn't apply to other things like fair use or publicity rights. And you know very simple summarization of the legal code. And then behind that even there's metadata. So we provide a way to describe our licenses, thus that search engines or other crawlers and, and web systems out there can understand in a real sense what the license permits or does not permit. So um, here's a, an example of some HTML um, that uses RDFA, which is a, a, micro, or a, a metadata format, um, which basically you know, incorporates some Dublin Core 
terms, you can see span property DC colon title. Um, DC stands for Dublin Core. Um, so the Dublin Core term title, this is a beautiful sushi. Um, Dublin Core term creator, it's created by Ulrich. Um, Dublin Core date, it has that date. But then also down here, there's a CC colon license. So in the Creative Commons namespace, there's a license, and that license URL points to the license which this work is available under. So what does this do, basically? So you have on the left-hand side here um, what browsers normally see, right? They see headlines, set behind the line, italics, some body text, and a few links. They, they just know their links. They don't know anything about those links. But what humans see when they read a, a web page, for instance, on, on an article, they see title, author, publication date, the article content, and then some tags, and then a copyright license. Humans understand when they see that because they, they can parse <laughs> English language. But if we use metadata to describe that English language such that the machines can understand it, then we can start to do really interesting things along the lines of text mining and, and other things which we haven't even thought of yet. Um, so I guess I'm going to pause right there and wait and see if there are any questions about Creative Commons or copyright before I move on to um, some of the metadata topics. So raise your hand or do whatever you need to do to ask a question. Looks like a, Elena has a question. Um, um, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, there's a, a couple. Um, Tria is also asking um, you to talk about fair use. But I had a question specifically about the coding. I, and this may be better directed to, um, to, to Tom. Um, I notice he hasn't uh, joined us yet. Um, I'm just wondering about what, whether you recommend that, that any content that's created include those those HTML tags. Yeah, so um, I'll get into a little bit more specific uh, metadata terms for educational use. Um, but the, the basic term, the, the license term, <clears throat> anything that you guys create or or are tagging or are publishing, republishing um, through this program, I would highly recommend that you use the metadata terms, including the license term, just so when other people are out there looking for high quality OER resources, they know um, to they, they know that your work is available under that license, um, and there's no question. And the search engines can find it for them. Um, and I actually expand on that answer a little bit during the LRMI um, section. And Tria, yeah, fair use. So fair use is kind of um, a touchy subject, especially for someone who not only is not a lawyer, but even if I was a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer. Um, so fair use um, the, to, in the very beginning is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the situation and the very case-specific facts um, play a huge role in determining if something is a fair use or not a fair use. Um, so I can, I should have included that in my slides, some I didn't. Let me just pull up my slides from my own crib notes when I'm talking about it. Uh, da -da -da -da. Let's see. Um, what would be a good one? Uh, so, doo -doo -doo -doo. I have some notes here that I use when I talk about fair use. Right, so it's the 107 section of the U.S. copyright law, um, and it's basically thought of as a balance to copyright law. Um, so, copyright law gives creators of the work a monopoly on that work, is how you can think about it. Only they are able to do derivatives, make copies of it, share with other people, license the things to other people, all those, the bundle of rights that I, that I listed out before, only the copyright owner or the copyright holder can do those things. So they have a, an, an effective monopoly on it. But fair use is the um, balance to that monopoly. So monopolies are almost inherently bad. Um, we, we know that from, from history, the, the U.S. Constitution, 
the, the drafters knew that um, there, there should be effective balances to every monopoly. Um, this is why we have antitrust law. Um, so the antitrust law for copyright is fair use. Um, and some of the things to think about if you're trying to determine if your use might be a fair use or not, um, there's actually a, a four-factor test. Um, the first factor being the nature of the original work. So whether that original work is factual or creative is kind of a spectrum you can think about. So the, the example I gave before about something that's not protected by copyright being 2 plus 2 equals 4, um, that is completely factual and there, there's no authorship or create, create creativity expressed there. But if I was doing a description of how a molecule um, behaves under certain conditions, right, some very factual thing that I just observed from nature, um, yes, there's a little bit of authorship and creativity there that might warrant copyright protection for my short description of that, but it's mostly factual. So if the original work is more factual, then the other extreme would be like a novel, something completely made up, um, creative work. Um, if it's more factual versus creative, then you're more likely to be a, your work or your use being a fair use. Um, the second factor is the purpose of the use. So whether or not your use um, is, uh, how to put this, um, your, how you use the work. So if you are, um, going to be just simply copying it and making without paying for another version, then that's not as potentially fair as if you were making a new derivative of it that incorporates a, a huge amount of other cultural works and you make a transformative use, right? Like you took, um, a, a good example would be, um, what is the, Oh, what was that new novel? I think it was based off the, the Scarlet Letter, which is like the Scarlet Letter and Zombies or something like that, um, where they took a work and they completely transformed it to be a work about zombies as opposed to Civil War um, politics. And that's a lot more transformative than just making a simple copy. Um, the third factor is amount of the original work. So if you use 100%, you make a full, full on copy of it versus making, you know, a 5% copy of it, it's more likely to be a fair use if you use less of it than more of it. And then the last factor is the effect on the market of the original work. So if what you're doing um, reduces the ability of the original author to extract money from their work, then it's less likely to be a fair use and more likely to not be a, to, to be copyright infringement. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is this is a four-factor test, and even if one of them, like even if you made a 100% copy of a work, that does not mean it's necessarily not a fair use. Um, when a judge sees a, fair, a copyright case in front of them and they, they need to do a, a fair use analysis, they look at each one of these factors practically independently, and it's not like they have like a plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, and they add them together and they see if it's a fair use or not. It's, there's a little bit more um, artistic interpretation there, but it's, you don't want to say, you know, if you do one, then you're, you're totally lost, or if you do the other, then you're completely okay, um, because it really just depends on every single specific case and the tax associated with that case, because everything is different, basically. Um, you can't even talk about textbooks in general, unfortunately, because the market for these different textbooks are completely different, different and um, different textbooks are more factual versus creative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so does that at all <laughs> help uh, TRIO with the fair use? I can talk a little bit more about um, some notable fair use cases and what it means for um, academics if you would like that. Well, with the silence, I'll just go on then. Um, so I hope that answered your question. And again, if you have any more specifics about fair use, um, especially in this project, the Open Course Library project, um, I would recommend. I, I'm a, I mean, I don't know um, what the official statement is from 
your project managers, but I would assume that you do not want to rely on a fair use analysis on whether or not you're going to include a certain work in in your open course. Um, so I would also recommend um, staying away from depending on fair use, especially since um, within the OER, if you're sharing this work with others, their fair use analysis is not the same fair use analysis that you make. Um, they are completely different than you. They have a different set of purposes and uses that they're going to make of that work. So you're, it's better for them and for people consuming OER in general to avoid using works um, under a fair use analysis just because it muddies the water and it makes OER almost back original to needing to figure out on a case by case 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 by case basis if what you want to do with it is legal or not. So there's my five minutes, maybe a little bit more on fair use. <laughs> um, so back to um, Rose's question about publishing, publishing um, or I guess maybe it was Lena's question about publishing your content with the metadata terms. So there's this new project that I'm working on called Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, or LRMI for short, um, that is addressing that very question actually. Um, so back in, um, I think it was last May about Google, Bing, and Yahoo, and a couple other search engines got together and they started this project collaboration called schema.org which basically addresses the problem of the varied number of metadata standards that are out there on the web right now. Um, so there's RDSA, there's microformats, um, there's tons of different versions of microformats, and, and people are using these different metadata schemas in, in different, um, not necessarily consistent ways. Um, so it's kind of a jumbled mess when you look at it on a web scale the way that Google does. So when Google indexes the web, they want to be able to understand a little bit more about that page using the metadata on that page. But if people aren't doing it consistently or using the terms incorrectly or using metadata terms that they don't even know about, then they can't extract that information. So they um, try to solve this problem um, the way that, that Google and Bing and Yahoo like to do, and they like to set a new standard. Um, so they, they set a new standard. It's called schema.org. Um, it's a microdata standard, if that means anything to you. Um, it's basically a way of embedding this metadata terms into the HTML of the page um, as you're describing the works. Uh, so when that came out, though, there were no education-specific terms in their schema. It was a pretty big schema. There were a lot of terms included, but it addressed mostly the uses for the, the commercial world, um, things like, you know, hair salon <laughs> or opening business hours or the price of something or how many comments there are on a blog post or how many ratings there are, things like that. Um, there weren't any specific terms for the educational community that would really help us. Um, so we got a grant co-sponsored between the Gates Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation, um, we being the Association of Education Publishers plus Creative Commons. So Association of Education Publishers, for those that don't know, it's the, the big ones. It's Pearson, McGraw-Hill, um, all those guys, the, the big textbook publishers out there. Um, we're working together on this metadata initiative. Um, you might think it's a little bit weird or odd bedfellows, but um, it makes sense because if we have a metadata schema that is only really used by the open community, then that's not really useful. Or if it's only used by the commercial community, then it's not really useful for everyone. We wanted a metadata standard that's useful for everyone, um, everyone in education. So that's why these two partners are actually, it makes a little bit of sense. Um, we'll, we balance the needs of, of all members of the educational community. Um, so. We are also, um, so I guess I could, right, one of the, the main advantages of LRMI right now, um, it will be, so by the way, it will be released um, hopefully the next month. We are, we just proposed it to schema.org um, for inclusion. Um, we have some conversations started about them adopting our terms. Um, that will happen hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, but one of the main wins for what LRMI provides users is a way to align content to competencies, 
We also have other terms like how long it takes the average student or normal student to complete the work or what type of educational content it is. Is it a textbook? Is it a presentation? Is it a syllabus? Those kinds of metadata terms. But also we have a competency metadata term which allows you to say something like this work aligns to this competency or teaches this competency or assesses this competency or requires this competency. Um, and competencies, as we know, um, are becoming, I guess, all the rage in both the good sense and the bad sense in the U.S. with the Common Core um, have been adopted by most states. Um, so for those that are unfamiliar with it, Common Core are a set of national competencies that um, describe various um, skill levels or competencies for students. Um, so they have two different subjects right now, mathematics and then English literature um, is the second one. And it's things like being able to multiply two single digit numbers. Um, so it kind of breaks it down at that level. Um, so you can say this chapter in a textbook teaches students how to multiply two single digit numbers. Um, and it also it, it goes from K through 12, basically. So it covers a lot of um, mathematics, especially that is important not only for K through 12 students, but also um, undergrad and community colleges and, and university students, because um, it, it applies to calculus and algebra and things like that, the, the basic math skills that um, most students need wherever they're um, in education. So the combination of these new common core standards that all states will be using and all content will really need to be aligned to because now states, when they're doing their acquisitions of new textbooks and content, they need to show, they need to prove that this content that they're buying enables their students to learn the various competencies that are required of them. Um, so the publishers and producers of that content are really going to be sure that they can describe their content in a way that says, yes, this content applies to these 20 competencies. And you know when you buy this textbook, for instance, that your students will, or that we, we promise that it will enable them to learn these 20 competencies. So this really is, is beneficial for the OER world, um, almost more so than the commercial world in the sense that now we can search all the great OER content out there that applies to a single concept. So it's really difficult right now when you search, for instance, Google for um, Calc 1. I mean, Calc 1 is a huge subject and there's various parts of it. Um, and it'd be great if we could figure out what are the best, pe or the best pieces for your students, your specific students, on how to teach them Calc 1. And if you can find all those resources in a very uh, uh, systematic and, and normalized way, then you'll be much better off when you're building your new courses or releasing your courses so that others can find the content that will help them. Um, so that's my pitch for LRMI. Um, it also works really well with this project from the Department of Education called the Learning Registry. This is a Department of Education project which is basically the um, email servers of educational metadata. So what they want to do, what they've done, is provided the plumbing, the, the parts that you don't really want to see but that need to be there um, to allow publishers and creators and consumers to share metadata about content. So it's not actually sharing the actual content, it's sharing the metadata of the content. Um, so one of the, the best use cases, the way to think about this, is if your LMS, I think um, maybe, I think you guys use Angel, if your, if Angel, had a system where you could search the learning registry for whatever. You can have a general keyword search or you can use some of the LRMI terms so you can limit it by competencies or you can even limit it by how many teachers said they used it in their class of um, community college math 101 or whatever it is, right? Um, intro to math course. You can ask it for all these different bits of information and then it will spit back to you um, information about the content that comes up for those search queries. Um, and then there will obviously be a URL on where you can get that content. So for the OER context, it, it makes a lot of sense um, if you can now not only learn the facts about something, but also 
the usage information about something. So if also Angel, for instance, allowed um, professors to click a little checkbox that said, as I create courses and include content in here, share that information with the learning registry. Just, you know, the, the emissions of the classroom, right? So what that information would be is things like um, this professor thought that this content, this content, and this content both taught students something about basic math, right? And now that information is fed back into the learning registry and there's a couple plus ones there for that content for basic math. And then if you have a bunch of professors all sharing this information about how they use their resources, when someone else needs to look up how to teach basic math, you can sort by how many professors in the state of Washington have already used this. And if there's, you know, obviously one thing that's bubbling towards the top, that's probably pretty useful for you in the state of Washington, or if you want to look for only um, stuff that is taught by community colleges, um, or stuff that's only taught by universities, or what have you. Um, you can really do some amazing search capabilities on that, and hopefully it enables for, um, the faculty to do really um, faster content creation and course creation uh, when they know a little bit more about the content that they can provide. Um, Right, so this is a little blurb about learning registry. I should have pushed forward a little bit earlier. Um, so we're coordinated with the LRMI um, project. Um, one of the, the lead on the learning registry is actually on the LRMI technical working group. So we're in, we're in pretty constant conversation. Um, we're good friends. So that, that works really well. Um, so with that, um, I think I covered four pretty big areas. So how copyright, creative commons, and metadata can apply to education and, and make this whole OER world a little bit more sane is what I hope. Any questions? Uh, Greg, there were a couple of questions in the chat box, uh, one from Quill and then another one uh, from Susan. Can you see those? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, my chat wasn't scrolling down. I was curious why no one was chatting while I was talking. Um, <laughs> so right, I got the fair use, and then let me scroll up here and look at those real quick. Um, do 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 do. I want to clarify in the beginning of your talk when you define useful articles as something that was outside of the copyright, and you're talking about what I would commonly call an invention rather than a creative work. Is that a good way to define it? Yeah, that's um, that's kind of how um, the law talks about the distinction there. Um, so a useful article is something that has been invented by someone or possibly even just discovered by someone um, that is protected by patents. So you have everything from how to make a great new chair, something that's been invented, to um, even unfortunately, in my opinion, my personal opinion, um, genes can be patented even though they're just discoveries. Um, so there's there's that distinction there. Um, basically, I don't know enough about patent law to really get into the specifics about um, with what is patentable and what is not necessarily. Um, just know that it is a huge and murky area, um, and those lawyers even get paid more than copyright lawyers. Um, so <laughs> that's something to, to add there. So Susan, um, Greg, adding a CC BY license does not mean the material cannot have a copyright, correct? The copyright in the case of the attribution does not restrict the use as long as a copyright holder then licensed under CC BY. Right, exactly. Um, that's a very good point. Um, Creative Commons licenses don't actually work unless the work is protect protected by copyright in the first place. So you can't apply a Creative Commons license to Shakespeare's work. Um, that stuff is in the public domain. It's not protected by copyright. The license doesn't even apply. Um, it's pretty much null and void. Um, so you, you can't restrict something that's in the public domain like that. Uh, so many times, actually, on, to, to answer your question a little bit more, you'll see um, on web pages or other documents, it'll say, uh, see with a circle 2012 Greg Grossmeyer released under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License. Um, pretty much just like what you typed out there. Um, so that's that's exactly accurate and that's totally okay. If, if that's how you guys are um, marking up your material, that's 
that's 100% great. Um, that's actually a little bit better than, than just saying this material is available under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Life License because you're giving a date that it was published and who it was published by, the, the name of the author, um, which is important information, maybe not this year, but in 80 years when it's potential that that work is in the public domain, you'll know that this work was published in 2012, thus in 20, um, or you know, I guess it's 70 years after I died, so whatever year that's going to be, um, that could be in the public domain. So that, that's really good information to put there. More information, always better. Any other questions? Um, if also the librarians for the project are online as well, and so if you have any questions um, for us, um, feel free to ask as well. Yeah, um, so I guess I know just enough about the OCL project to promote it <laughs> um, and also, you know, just, just in, to get me in trouble basically. So um, you guys, the, the stipulation is that each course can only require the students to purchase $30, I think it is, in textbooks or, or, in, or in course materials, um, thus a way to make that happen, to make students be able to only spend $30 on course materials. You're looking for OER materials that are applicable to that course. Um, so that's awesome. And then you're, you're making the courses, the content, kind of the, the, um, uh, the completed courses that you've created under that stipulation publicly available um, under the attribution only license. Um, so I guess my question is, when you're going out there looking for material, um, what kind of limitations are you putting on yourself for what can be included with that? Are you um, only limiting yourself to stuff that's under a Creative Commons license? Or are you also allowing um, people to include things that are free but not um, under a Creative Commons license? Um, we're uh, doing, I think, a, a little bit of both. We're also going out things that aren't licensed under Creative Commons. Um, it, we're um, often just go asking, finding the, the owners of copyright and, and asking for permission um, for things as well. So it's really pretty, pretty mixed. Would, would the rest of you agree with that? Yeah, I've, I've gotten permission from copyright owners to distribute their work for the purposes of this class. Um, and they still maintain full copyright on the work, but allowing us to distribute and allowing students access to the material. That's great. That's, that's actually really awesome that you are um, going back and contacting copyright holders and asking for permission like that um, and enabling them to see that their content is actually really useful and would be really useful um, in a less restricted way. Hopefully they, they get the hint. Um, but that's, that's awesome even if you just get the permission just for your one course. Um, so Susan had a question about the Hottie Trust suit. Um, so that's really funny um, because I, when I worked at the University of Michigan Library, I was the project manager for the or Orphan Works project for the Hottie Trust, um, which if you read the lawsuit that the Authors Guild has against the Hottie Trust was kind of um, one of the main sticking points that they, they had. Um, they were really upset about the Orphan Works project. Um, for those that aren't aware, Orphan Works are works that are protected and restricted by copyright but you can't find the copyright owner who holds that copyright anymore. So um, copyright doesn't just disappear when the person disappears um, or when their heirs disappear. So you could theoretically be in a situation where no one has a legal right to hold the copyright to a work, but the work is still restricted by copyright. So even if you wanted to ask permission, you couldn't, no matter how much research you did. So we, we being the University of Michigan, 
we're trying to find a way to quickly identify possible orphan works. And um, we, we instituted a plan, and we did that, and we hadn't yet opened up any works, but we released a list of works that we thought were potential orphans. And just releasing that list was enough to annoy the Authors Guild, and, and they brought suit. Um, but to answer your question directly, does that affect the OCL? Not at all. Um, nothing that you all are doing should be affected by either the Authors Guild versus Hathi Trust suit or the Authors Guild and uh, American Association of Publishers versus Google suit. Um, so that's kind of the overarching lawsuit right now is the publishers and the Authors Guild are suing Google over simply scanning the works and making the Google Book Search program. Um, both of those are ongoing suits. They're not going to be decided this year even. It's going to be a while. Um, but you can, if you're looking for content that's um, in the Hathi Trust from the University of Michigan and in, the, in that database, um, you can still do that. And you can, the only stuff that the Hathi Trust makes open for web viewing is content that is in the public domain um, or that we know we have the rights to make open. So um, things in that category are content that, for instance, the University of Michigan Library Publishing um, department has published. So the University of Michigan Library um, publishes journals, journal articles, and books, and things like that. And we know that those works we have the rights to make open. So even if they're in the Hathi Trust, those are open. Um, thus, so basically summarizing, if you find anything in the Hathi Trust that you can access and you can view in full view, that stuff is is okay for you. Um, you can. I would recommend um, downloading a copy of, you know, for instance, a, a public domain book or textbook or whatever it is, if you find something that's useful, just so that you have a copy of it. Um, and not saying that the Hardy Trust is ever going to go away. It's actually most likely, even if the lawsuits um, go badly, it probably won't go as badly as to completely destroy the Hardy Trust. Um, so it will always be there as a resource. but. Um, better safe than sorry to have a copy of the stuff that you want to use year after year. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, are there any other questions either for Greg or for um, the project librarians? You're very welcome, Amy. Have a good class. Uh, so Greg, do you want to address the question about um, the, the question that uh, Susan had about the independent authors, filmmakers releasing materials to us? Um, and the question of whether that decreases any commercial rewards. Um, Susan, I just want to share one of my experiences um, in requesting permission for um, some online films uh, that we were using for the drama class. Um, these were African um, examples of like African um, acting, African traditional African theater. And um, and of course, this may not be the case. In, it may not be the case with everyone, but they were um, seemed very excited about having um, their materials exposed um, to audiences that they may not previously have known of um, through the course, through this this open course library project. So. Um, hopefully, um, that that will will be the response. Yeah, the only thing I could add to that is um, that's it's really a case-by-case -case basis for all these um, 
producers of content. Uh, we have a kind of a similar example to yours, Maria, is uh, or uh, um, sorry, um, the similar example there is at the University of Michigan. We have uh, Ojibwe um, professors that are really keen on sharing their content that they've created, um, all their videos and and things like that. Um, so they see it as a, a plus for them. But then of course you have um, so, for instance, like a, a filmmaking uh, class or, or a, um, a film studies class, um, they're going to be probably talking about works that are protected by copyright from um, big name publishers or something of the sort. Um, and that's just not a way that you're probably just not going to be able to get that content available for free for those students, um, especially not under an open license. Um, and that's just a, you know a harsh reality. Um, I would encourage people to create the openly licensed film class, uh, film studies class, but that probably won't happen anytime soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you can. I would be completely honest with the people that you're talking to about licensing their content. Um, if you're asking them for permission to license their work under a Creative Commons license, they need to be fully aware of that and um, agree to it. Um, if you're just asking for permission to um, share their content um, to the students. You know, what, what are the terms of the permission that you're asking for? As long as they're uh, made aware of it and, and agree in in good faith, and there was a meeting of the minds, as they like to say, um, then then you're okay. Um, I I wouldn't obviously try to mislead anyone just to make their stuff more open. Right on. Um, thanks, Greg. Uh, unless there's any other questions, I just wanted to thank you for um, taking the time to meet with us online and share um, all of this really, really awesome, uh, good information. And uh, yeah, we may be emailing you with questions. Awesome. You're very welcome. Um, and yeah, my email is always open. Um, and <laughs> maybe I, I may have a few day delay sometimes, but um, feel free to email me. Um, I didn't put my email there just for show. Um, please, please feel free to contact and keep up the good work. And I'm excited to be involved in whatever little way I can with this great project. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, and so everybody, we're um, going to, when we are done with recording, we're going to email out the link to everybody um, to this um, this meeting. Um, unfortunately, we were actually, I think we did probably start about five minutes um, earlier than 9.30, but um, it will be able to, those of you who came in a little bit late should be able to catch those uh, those five minutes on the recording. Thanks, everyone. I'm just going to say thank you again and goodbye. I'm going to sign off now. It looks like you guys are going to have a, a quick little librarian's discussion. Take care.